All right, uh, very good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome back to our lecture series um, on this Monday evening. It's the concluding session, so we've reached our final destination in this lecture series. And the point of today's lecture is not to bring a lot of additional content. I think we've covered plenty of ground throughout the lecture series already, uh, and there's plenty to uh, digest and uh, to read through. The point is to reflect a little bit on what some key themes were, what we could, what conclusions we could draw. And I'm hoping this will be sort of a bit of an interactive session as well. So uh, I'll give you some chance to um, uh, participate and to, to articulate your thoughts. Um, uh, the, the title of today's session is the political and social relevance of algorithms and our, what I'll do is I, I'll show you a couple of slides um, from a paper by Tarleton Gillespie that is sort of a bit famous, I, I guess, in the film, uh, in the field, um, and we'll use that as a sort of springboard to uh, reflect on the lecture series overall. So in terms of a quick outline. Um, as I said, I'll speak a bit about the relevance of algorithm, uh, algorithms, this sort of seminal paper. Uh, then we'll do a quick look back, um, simply um, by help of, uh, of Moodle, we'll, um, we'll consider who's been our, our guests, what the themes were, what the readings were, and so on. Uh, I'll then ask you to evaluate the course, and I'll give you a bit of time for doing that, you should all have received by now an email, an automated email uh, from Uspace, and I'll just give you 10 minutes or so to uh, fill out the, the evaluation questionnaire. And I'll finish with some information on the exam, some of which may duplicate a bit of what I uh, said two weeks ago, but uh, uh, just to sort of be on the safe side and for everybody to have understood the exam format and the dates and everything. And also, uh, I'll also give you a chance to ask questions about that and I'll give you sort of a, a bit of a preview of how the exam platform looks like. So there shouldn't be any surprises uh, next week or whenever you're going to, uh, intending to take the exam. And we'll then close with a a round of a Q&A for any remaining questions to be answered, hopefully. All right, so um, the relevance of algorithms is a text that I assigned for the final session, and it is si simply a relatively sweeping uh, and generalist um, text on what Gillespie calls uh, public relevance algorithms. So. We, throughout the lecture series, we started with a sort of closer, narrow focus on algorithms, algorithmic governance, the governance of uh, and by algorithms, and so on. And then we broadened up in a sense and delved on um, various topics that are related to algorithms, related also to data, um, to the politics of data, and to decision making problems um, and and challenges and ramifications of the use of data and decision making across various fields. And today, I think we're coming back sort of to the start of the lecture series where we wondered, well, what, what are algorithms, but also what do they do and what is interesting from a social science point of view in studying uh, these phenomena. So what Gillespie also does in that, um, in that article is try to sketch something of a research agenda, what needs to be addressed in the future in terms of studying uh, the impacts or the effects of algorithms. Um, in terms of the, the context of the author, Gillespie is a, an adjunct professor in the Department of Communication at Cornell. So he's got more of a sort of communication or media background. Um, he's also with Microsoft Research. But the language he uses is, I guess, most closely aligned with the 
social study of technology uh, or the social study of science uh, kind of tradi tradition. So he's, he's, he's a technology scholar uh, with a, uh, from a social scientific background. Um, the article um, that he wrote, The Relevance of Algorithms, appeared in uh, an edited volume by Gillespie, Boczkowski and Foot, uh, Media Technologies, Essays on Communication, Materiality and Society. I should have added the uh, year, I think it was published in 2014. So it's not one of those texts that just appeared sort of very, very recently, but it's, it's already got a bit of a history. Okay, so what does Gillespie tell us in that uh, piece, the relevance of algorithms. He starts with the uh, with our original question that we tackled in uh, session one of our lecture series and also session two to an extent. What what even are algorithms? And he reminds us: well, algorithms need not be software, but they are sort of, sort of the thing that computers uh, do. And he uh, the one definition that he provides in his papers uh, is uh, algorithms are, an, are encoded procedures, okay? So the procedural aspect is important. Encoded meaning put into code, uh, textual in some form um, or script uh, in some form, and they transform input data into some desired output. Uh, so, if you recall, we, we called that the input throughput output um, framework in, in the first uh, two sessions of the lecture series. Based on, and that is important, uh, specified calculations. So there is a mathematical core, so to speak, or a computational core uh, to the working of the algorithm. But in its essence, it's a transformation of data into some sort of output and that output could be uh, informing some decision, um, certifying something, creating some sort of knowledge, uh, essentially. These procedures, um, these algorithmic procedures, they name both a problem um, and the steps by which it should be solved. We also, um, got familiar with that viewpoint in the, in the first session that algorithms are problem solving mechanisms. So that reappears here. There is some sort of problem in the sense of we need to parse some sort of information. There is something perhaps too chaotic or too big to see through and an algorithm will help us to, to put structure into it, to sort it, to make sense of it in some uh, in some way. Um, and it being a procedure, that tackling of the problem is a sort of logical stepwise one where a set of instructions are being followed from one thing, one, one step to the next. And each step in the way is sort of explicit and um, clearly demarcated. Um, I think Barbara in her session also referred to the, the notion that an algorithm has the has a sort of character of a cookbook recipe. First you add, I don't know, sugar, flour, whatever, water, and then you do that and then you boil it and so on. Th that is what is meant by steps, so the procedural aspect. It's a set of instructions. And as we said, they need not be software, but most often when we're talking about algorithms, they could be software. In a sense, you could call, call uh, instructions for navigation an algorithm or instructions for, um, for how to cook a, a, a dish. Okay. Um, what is the role of algorithms then? So what do they do and why do we even care about them? Um, Gillespie tells us that algorithms play an increasingly important role in selecting what information is considered most relevant to us. Um, we also touched upon this, um, both in the first session and in later sessions as well, 
that we live in a sort of algorithmic age or that uh, there's a sort of algorithmic society that has been shaped and that we encounter um, these kind of procedures or hidden structures in our day-to-day uh, information consumption, for instance. But I find it quite interesting. So Gillespie puts a slight twist on this and he says, uh, what's most important um, or its most important role is really that relevance is somehow structured or mediated by algorithms. Uh, and he gives the obvious examples in the sense of, for instance, search engines, the Googles, the Bings, the Yahoos and so on uh, of the web, um, recommendation algorithms, uh, which we encounter every day when we do um, online shopping or dating or other things uh, on the web. And um, there's something of the sort, well, people like you were also interested in this kind of book. And you may wish to consider that as well. Uh, so the kind that Amazon, for instance, uh, uh, does regularly. But also a third domain that he considers is interactions on social networking sites, such as Facebook or Twitter uh, or other uh, social, uh, social networks, where uh, things like, you could be interested in this person, would you like to follow um, this or that guy? Um, this is a trending topic, you may want to check this out, things like that, or the interactions indeed in terms of likes and shares and, and faiths and, uh, and so on. All right, taken together, uh, Gillespie argues that algorithms provide a means to know what there is to know and how to know it and to participate in social and political discourse. We'll unpack this in, throughout the ne uh, next couple of slides, but it's quite important that there is an, a relationship between this procedural um, sort of understanding of data, the aspect of relevance, and what you could call knowledge. Uh, so, so something that, um, um, that human behavior operates on, essentially. Um, and very often it is the case that algorithms um, sort of structure that the things that we even consider knowable. And they also structure the way of how we acquire knowledge. And that um, is ever more so as ever more uh, information becomes digital. Um, I don't know how many of you in the audience would consider themselves digital natives, but for many of us nowadays, it's, uh, it's very, I think, um, natural that um, all sorts of books, for instance, um, uh, public documents, um, reports, um, public data uh, available online. Um, but that, that is some, something that is relatively new. I still recall the days when uh, it was quite revolutionary that Google Books, for instance, um, digitized the um, uh, whole libraries and, and came up with that scanning technique uh, and doing that in an automated fashion and then made this searchable uh, as well. It was quite trans transformative. All the early days of Wikipedia where suddenly there was an encyclopedia uh, for free that you could edit and that you could um, uh, tap into and that you could mine as well to an extent. That was cross-reference where you could um, sort of surf the web and drill down into topics. So we've, in a sense, become so accustomed to that um, that we don't realize it anymore. But that means that with ever more information becoming digital, that the thing, the procedures that render knowledge from this data and from this information also become more relevant and become indeed quite powerful in a sense. And Gillespie argues that increasingly social and political discourse, the way that people communicate with, uh, with each other, the way that society is negotiated, the way that problems are perceived and so on, 
the way that political movements get mobilized um, happen through this, uh, through this way. Human discourse and knowledge become subject to procedural algorithmic logics. So the algorithm sort of forces some sort of logic on, uh, on this discourse. And he says that algorithms are generally speaking now simply a key logic for governing the flows of information, broadly speaking. Okay, so I've told you that Gillespie introduces that idea of uh, public relevance algorithms. So let's go a little bit into, um, into that and wonder what, what you might mean by that. Um, so public relevance algorithms, uh, uh, he says, is algorithms that produce and certify knowledge that is somehow publicly relevant by selecting what is most relevant from what he calls a corpus of data. Okay. Um, I'll have a look onto, into the chat as well. Okay, we'll come back to that question later on. Um, okay, so they produce and certify knowledge um, and by selecting what these algorithms consider most relevant from a corpus of data. So by considering something most relevant or more relevant and by implication also less relevant, what happens is a sort of, uh, is a form of algorithmic assessment and this assessment, uh, Gillespie argues, represents a particular kind of knowledge logic. Um, and to, I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in due course. It's a, a specific kind of assessment logic or knowledge logic. What is, what is even considered knowledge, what is even considered data, and what is con considered relevant. And he thinks that um, we always followed some sort of knowledge logics throughout the history of, uh, of mankind, essentially. And that this algorithmic kind of uh, assessment is, uh, quote unquote, as momentous as having relied on credentialed experts, the scientific method, common sense, or the word of God. So all of these were previous um, uh, knowledge logics in a way things of how to get to knowledge, to certified knowledge. Uh, for instance, we ask experts. Um, algorithms need not replace that fully, not at all, but it's, it's a new and, uh, and sort of singular kind of uh, and distinct kind of knowledge logic. So we could ask credentialed experts, the professors, the uh, scientists, the, uh, I don't know, medical experts, technical experts, and so on. Uh, the scientific method, um, we need evidence, uh, we, took, we, we ask for falsifiability, we ask for data, we ask for um, experimental evidence and so on. Common sense is of course one knowledge logic as well, uh, just going by your gut in instincts or, or experimental knowledge essentially, things like, uh, well, this has always been done in this or that way. Or indeed the word of God, so uh, arguments from religious authority um, or things along those lines. These are all particular kinds of knowledge logics. And Gillespie says, well, the algorithmic uh, pro production certification um, of knowledge through based on corpora of data is also a uh, knowledge logic of, uh, of this kind. And since this is such a momentous uh, phenomenon or shift in, the, in a sense uh, in, in the creation of knowledge, this also calls for an interrogation, he argues, of algorithms and their political ramifications, what they do to the political and social world. And he sketches in his paper uh, six areas for continuing research or dimensions uh, of where public relevance algorithms have an impact or have some uh, sort of balance um, and where we need um, to have sort of a scientific scrutiny um, practiced. And I'll just sketch these uh, six dimensions of public relevance algorithms briefly, and then I'll talk a little bit uh, about each of these consecutively. Oops. 
Okay, so six dimensions of public relevance algorithms that have in Gillespie's views political valence. Number one, dimension number one, patterns of inclusion. Um, we talked about, we had a whole session um, by uh, Salim, delivered by Salim a couple of weeks ago, uh, where we talked about discrimination uh, through algorithms or algorithmic discrimination, I think the session was called. It's now a big, big topic uh, of, its, of itself. And uh, indeed, uh, Gillespie lists patterns of inclusion, and you could, you could uh, rephrase it as inclusion and exclusion as well, as the first and, and perhaps arguably one of the most important aspects of the political valence of public relevance algorithms. The choices behind what makes it into an index in the first place, what is excluded, and how data is made algorithm ready. Okay, how, how is the kind of data created that computers can even understand? And in, uh, in terms of what the result of algorithmic uh, computations uh, are, what then makes it into the results, the suggestions, uh, the things that are uh, considered knowledge, that are considered relevant uh, to the user or the consumer or the citizen. Number two, uh, cycles of anticipation. Uh, and this is about what the design of algorithms makes in terms of, uh, or expects in terms of uh, user desires in a sense. So the implications of algorithm providers attempts to thoroughly know and predict their users and how the conclusions they draw can matter. And we'll speak about that uh, as well in just a little bit more depth. So anticipation meaning here, what do algorithm providers uh, think the user wants, right? So if you, if you say Amazon um, suggests a, uh, a book to you, uh, something that you may like, they have some theory of the user um, and they um, construct that theory based on other user um, data on purchasing behavior, on predictions essentially, because they don't, don't really know what, uh, what, what the next user will actually like or not, but they have some sort of model. Um, and that model is anticipatory and it also leads to certain user behavior. So that's why there's a cyclicality or a sort of feedback loop in that. Okay, number three, third dimension of public relevance algorithms with political uh, valence is the evaluation of relevance. And we talked about relevance already. Um, so meaning the criteria by which algorithms determine what is relevant, what criteria, and how, what criteria are taken into consideration. How do you even construct relevance? Um, because there is no sort of, there's never, Gillespie argues, uh, an independent body or authority that could really at the end arbit and say, well, this is actually relevant. So each algorithm provider will come up with their own sort of relevance metric or relevance logic uh, and certain criteria by which algorithms decide for something being relevant or less relevant. Uh, then following from that, the question of how those criteria are transparent or whether they are obscured from us. And by us, he means the users here, um, I presume and how they enact political choices about appropriate and legitimate knowledge. Okay, so this touches also on issues of censorship uh, or implicit censorship. So every sort of relevance decision means that something is considered irrelevant or that something is uh, not on the front page, not at the top, um, not visible. Uh, to the user. So these are the first three uh, dimensions of public relevance algorithms valence. What about the next three? Um, 
Gillespie says there is also uh, something that an aspect of uh, algorithms that needs to be considered and that um, needs scrutiny in a sense, uh, which is the promise of algorithmic op objectivity, which is hard to escape. Uh, the way the technical character of an algorithm is positioned as an assurance of impartiality, okay, and how that claim is maintained in the face of controversy. Again, uh, touching on issues of, uh, of censorship, for instance. Um, but each each algorithm is, or the point even of an algorithm is very often not only efficiency, but objectivity in the sense that some some procedure. Uh, so tested explicit procedure is behind um, uh, a data crunching exercise, right? And um, we, using the same inputs, we get the, uh, the same output in a sense. So there's some sort of reliability, but there's also impartiality, supposedly at least, in that the machine does it, there is no human oversight or intervention it, there's some there's a machine like behavior um, and Gillespie sort of calls that a little bit into question to ask well what uh, is that really an objective knowledge uh, creation um, model or how do sub, sub, how does subjectivity or partiality enter uh, enter this he also um, asked about well, what happens in the face of controversy and that most of the time or we have many examples um, some of you, which you may have heard from the media where in the light of controversy um, uh, algorithmic outputs were then either not followed or um, were censored or were uh, reinterpreted and so on Okay, we'll also talk a little bit about more about what Gillespie calls the entanglement with practice. So he thinks that algorithms are, first of all, not something that is simply sort of top down designed. Um, it is all, always sort of to be understood in the use context. Um, and it is also mired in all the sort of intricacies and complexities of it being uh, a practice tool, right? So it is something that is not purely of an abstract philosophical or mathematical uh, value or the subject of textbooks, but rather um, it is, you see it in the wild and it is, it gets sort of entangled with, uh, with the practices of um, behavior, for instance, in social media or or um, consumer behavior and so on. So uh, to read it in the words of, uh, of Gillespie, how users reshape their practices to suit the algorithms they depend on, how they try to game the system perhaps, how they adapt behavior to, um, uh, to be successful in an algorithmically managed context, for instance, and how they can turn algorithms into terrains for political contest, sometimes even to interrogate the politics of the algorithm itself. Sixth and final um, aspect of public relevance algorithms, political valence is what um, Gillespie following others, uh, of course, calls the production of calculated publics. So, he argues that um, the way that algorithms work shapes, uh, sort of sociologically speaking, the kinds of networks that people operate in, and even the kinds of communities people think they belong to. Think of social media circles of friends, uh, or indeed the uh, recommendation algorithms um, that give that serve to you certain. Uh, reading uh, material and so on, uh, and which creates a sort of calculated public as well. How the algorithmic presentation of publics uh, back to themselves shape a public's sense of itself. So do you consider yourself 
uh, a member of certain groups, uh, a member of certain networks, and what kind of member, uh, and who is best positioned to benefit from that knowledge. So these six uh, aspects, problems, perhaps you could call them, are areas that um, Gillespie argues where public relevance algorithms have some political or social relevance uh, and where we, we should exercise scrutiny. And I'll now go into a bit more detail on each of those. And if you have any sort of anything to add on, uh, on, uh, on one of them or, or more of them, just uh, feel free to raise your hand or um, post a note into the chat and we'll, um, we'll consider your, your comment. So going back to patterns of inclusion, what um, Gillespie tells us here is the key, um, the key to, to the algorithmic procedure is really the underlying data or the databases. Algorithms themselves are, what he says, inert, meaningless machines until they get paired with databases on which to function, right? So it's not really the algorithm that is, um, that can even be problematic. The algorithm is simply calcu calculating, right? The algorithm is equations at the end of the day of some sort uh, or instructions. But what makes them potentially relevant, politically speaking, or to the, uh, to the general public is, well, what data are we using them on, right? Uh, and most of the time, this data can be quite sensitive. It can be uh, data on the behavior of, um, of persons. It can be data on the mobility, on the desires, uh, on the histories, on the status uh, of people, on their health. We had plenty of uh, examples through the lecture series where it was problematized or interrogated how uh, decision making in the medical world is shaped and impacted by algorithmic procedures. So why is that interesting? Well, because it's about medical data and these kind of databases are being tapped into. So algorithms themselves, inert, the, without data, they don't do anything. They're meaningless. They're machines, um, but they're machines that operate on data, and that's what makes them uh, interesting. And that's also what, what brings this inclusion-exclusion uh, problems into the focus. So something that Gillespie tries to hammer home is um, the data is never already there. It is never purely raw. It, all, uh, it always has to be constructed in a way. It has to be collected in the first place. And sometimes already data collection itself is mired in, uh, in controversy. Consider, for instance, Google Street View um, that was challenged in some places legally where um, uh, Google sent around cars with a uh, with sensors and, uh, and video cameras mounted, and they took pictures essentially of the surroundings. And then um, this um, uh, photo information was, uh, was provided through Google Maps. Uh, or indeed, uh, Google Earth that uh, used to draw on, um, on satellite uh, photographic data. So this is where tech companies themselves collect data, but of course they also might just tap into existing databases such as from um, public registers, from hospitals, from, uh, from other uh, things. Um, and, and sometimes, as I said already, that collection can uh, become controversial. For instance, in the Google Street View case, there was the question, well, what does it mean when, a, when that information about the neighborhood is so readily present. For instance, just a simple question, what does that mean for property prices? Uh, if people can easily look up uh, the street where you live, you don't even need to go there. What does it mean for perhaps tourism? What does it mean for um, general location-based services uh, that all this information suddenly becomes transparent? And also, of course, what does it mean for privacy if a car goes around and 
takes a photo of your backyard and uh, your, I don't know, unmowed lawn and, and the tree you always meant to cut down, but that's still there and so on. Uh, and that is, it's a picture that is updated con uh, continuously, but uh, as they say, the internet tends to not forget things. So once that's somehow in the public domain, you can uh, go back and, 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 and also see uh, views of places, um, pre uh, how they uh, look previously. Okay, collection is one thing. The readying of data is another interesting thing. Uh, and what Gillespie is adamant about is that information must be sort of made algorithm ready. So we said that the algorithm is a meaningless machine, but one that becomes powerful in connection with data, in reading data, but the data must be machine readable. Um, if it isn't, uh, the mach machine will not make much sense of it, um, or it can simply not even operate on it. So data is always readied for the algorithm. Um, and in the reading for the algorithm, sometimes already contentious de decisions can be made. So for instance, Gillespie gives the uh, example of Amazon for some time having classified gay-friendly literature as uh, into the category of adult, okay? So that's, um, that's a kind of category that presumably I imagine not everybody gets suggested for instance. Um, or that um, where search may be a bit restricted, uh, certainly perhaps age uh, information may be oops, uh, taken into consideration uh, and so on. So if you automatically classify any sort of gay-friendly literature as adult, uh, you kind of put it into a category uh, and that again has in, may have uh, implications for consumer behavior and for the production of knowledge uh, and so on. Uh, in due course. So the category itself, the labeling that may seem naive, well, it's just just a category, right? But that boxing and that reading for the algorithm, which then simply blindly runs on that information has already pre-structured uh, the result to a degree. And sometimes um, uh, says Argus Gillespie, um, uh, before results can uh, can be algorithmically provided, information is already excluded or demoted, or it is actively being excluded or demoted through the algorithm. So, for instance, YouTube uh, demotes certain content, pushes other content, and sometimes quite weird content. I find um, so um, it it may ask well. Perhaps you, uh, you're interested in this kind of content, um, but it will demote certain content it perhaps considers harmful, right? So I don't know if how easy it is to find instructions for suicide, for instance, on YouTube, or instructions for self-harm, or instructions for how to build a bomb, or what, uh, God knows what. Uh, so certain U uh, YouTube content will be demoted, other content will be promoted based on the following of, um, of the creators, based on advertising as well, of course, but also based on some quality judgments that, um, that goes into the YouTube algorithm. Another example of that would be um, Twitter promoting so-called trending issues. I don't know if you follow this kind of stuff, but... Um, uh, there are certain topics that uh, Twitter tries to sort of um, extract from uh, from the universe of tweets based on hashtags or based on word occurrences or something of that sort. Um, and then it says, well, this is a hot topic in a sense. Check it out and uh, click on it. So it tries to um, uh, curate in a sense the, the feed and by that it promotes certain issues and demotes other issues. Okay, so that is the first um, aspect uh, of political valence, patterns of inclusion. And again, Gillespie says, algorithms themselves meaningless, inert, they, they are machines, but working on data, they become powerful. And the creation of data itself 
is not sort of innocent. It needs to be collected. It needs to be made ready for the algorithm. And they're already in the, um, in the readying, uh, very often, uh, patterns of ex exclusion or demotion uh, working on the data. Let's turn to cycles of anticipation. That's, that was the second aspect that Gillespie talked about. So we said anticipation is uh, sites or, or algorithm providers having a theory of, of the user, uh, having a, a social theory in a sense, um, and trying to anticipate what do users want based on typically statistical models uh, of some sort. The most perhaps extreme or obvious blatant example of that would be the autocomplete function, right? You type something onto your, um, into your smartphone keyboard and it tries to autocomplete. Or Google indeed um, started autocompleting um, search um, at some point. It used to not have that feature. Uh, if you're a user of, uh, of Google search, if you've been a user of Google search for some time, there was a time when Google not, well, the interface looked a bit different. Um, there was a feel lucky button or something like that. Uh, and there was also no autocomplete. You just keyed into, keyed into the search bar, your, uh, uh, your search query and nothing. Uh, and, and then came the results. Nowadays, it tries to fill in the blank sort of, again, based on the statistical model of what Google thinks you are going to uh, want to be looking for. And that implies that Google has some sort of dossier uh, on you in a sense. Uh, so that's the, in the words of Solovi, a digital dossier um, that has been compiled based on your search history based on other data as well. And we'll, um, I'm not sure I, I have that on the slide, but um, Google claims that uh, I think a couple hundred uh, features or data points go into every search for every user. So they, they would think that your location uh, obviously matters, perhaps the time of the day when you enter the query, perhaps your gender matters, perhaps your, I don't know, education level matters, certainly your language will matter and so on. And there's a host of other things that Google takes into consideration with every search query, query that you run. So that is sort of the digital dossier um, that is, so provides your, what Cheney Lippold calls your algorithmic identity, what the, the algorithm provider thinks you are, the kind of individual you are. And for every user, something like this uh, exists and uh, sometimes in um, more plastic, more richer shape and sometimes in, in not so much. The interesting thing is, and, and that leads to this being a cycle of anticipation, is that with each behavioral step you take, which with each move you make sort of on the, on the net, with each search query you enter and with each importantly result you click on, the algorithm of course learns in a sense as well and incrementally in light of your behavior changes. So that's also something in, uh, important. Um, we said without data, the, the algorithm is inert, but with data, it's not inert anymore. It's not static. It becomes actually a dynamic learning incrementally changing system, right? Almost as if it was sort of rewarded or punished in some way by you clicking um, on certain content, right? And if that content is, if the relevant content is on, on page 10 of the search results, um, maybe it, it didn't do such a good job at uh, dishing out or uh, presenting to you the most relevant results. Um, um, with top priority. So what Gillespie says, users are in a sen sense complicit, um, as if that there was so, so, some sort of crime happening, but you get, the, you get the idea, right? So 
the user behavior co-shapes the algorithm. It's not just the algorithm forcing itself onto the social world, but people are complicit in that they um, their behavior, in a sense, shapes the algorithm, that information on their behavior is drawn into um, the further incremental development. And that may, in most, most time, be automated development. One concern, of course, is privacy. We've talked about that, and Nicolas uh, Forgo did a whole uh, session on uh, the law of algorithms, as he called it. You recall that we visited the GDPR, um, uh, mostly EU legislation, the Digital Services Act, and so on. And um, privacy is clearly one extremely uh, important area of concern for legal scholars, uh, and one that is sort of top of the agenda whenever we consider things like such digital dossiers and the understanding uh, of, of user behavior. But argues Gillespie, also the opposite can be a problem, namely in a sense too little privacy and uh, too crude, too simplified, too much ex uh, extrapolated knowledge based uh, um, on user behavior. So very often, and that was something that was also touched upon perhaps in Salim's um, uh, session on algorithmic discrimination, very often the um, uh, the reproach, the uh, the complaint about uh, algorithms is they simplified something too too strongly or too crudely. Or think of the gay friendly literature example, where somebody equated that with uh, simply not safe for work content or something of that sort. Um, uh, that was simply crude, right? That was an extrapolation that uh, that wasn't um, uh, that wasn't justified. Um, but one that one could argue has does not have the problem of there being too fine grained, too private, too sensitive information. But in a sense, the opposite: it's too crude. It's putting things into very broad. Um, very crude categories, for instance, based on demography, based on sexual orientation in the case that I mentioned, based on your geographical location, you're suddenly boxed into some sort of um, community that you may not even belong to so much, or that may be more heterogeneous than, um, uh, than the algorithm providers presume. Okay, so that makes that whole thing a uh, sort of cycle, a complicit cycle of anticipation. The, but the underlying logic is always we anticipate what users want, uh, and then we try to have some sort of data verify or falsify this um, this theory, this anticipatory hypothesis sort of about human behavior. Okay, aspect number three is the evaluation of relevance. And that's something that... Uh, um, that the Gillespie is clearly keen to discuss, since also the, the, the article is called The Relevance of Algorithms. Uh, so that's at the center, in a sense, uh, evaluating relevance. It's something that seems innocuous, that seems innocent. Well, these are the top results, this is the best, uh, and so on. Um, but really, what is relevance? So Gillespie tells us the following thing, search, things like news feeds, news aggregators, curation of content, um, broadcasting uh, sites and so on, identify which of trillions of bits of information best meets the criteria at hand, and which of these will satisfy the user and the user's presumed aims, right? We never know the real aims, but there's some presumption of a name called multiple aims. And the problem is, again, there is a corpus of data that is really large, trillions of bits um, that need to be parsed and uh, understood, quote unquote. OK, and I just mentioned the, uh, the, the uh, Google query. Um, 
um, well, cu customization is the wrong word, but targeting in a sense. Uh, according to Google, uh, Gillespie reports its search algorithm examines over 200 signals for every query. So that's that goes into the evaluation of relevance. It also means that different search results will be presented to different users. Okay, so very often when we use Google or indeed other search platforms or other um, other places where content is curated, we kind of assume, well, this is simply how it looks, right? When we Google, I don't know, a, a name, somebody's name or so, or instructions for how to do something and so on. We think, well, that's it. That's how the internet looks like in a sense, right? Well, that's not how it looks to, uh, to everybody, um, depending on your location, depending on your age, depending on your language background and so on, different uh, content is, is, is being curated differently for different individuals. It's individualized, it's personalized, um, and it is sort of tailored or targeted to the individual based on certain presumptions about the individual. And we just discussed that in the previous slide. The challenge Gillespie argues is that relevance itself is what he says is a fluid, it's a loaded judgment. It's open to interpretation. And there isn't really any independent authority or metric that could once and for all say, say well, this is the right result for that kind of query. It's a fluid thing and it's an assumption in a sense, and it remains an assumption and any authority out there will make different relevance judgments in a sense. What's important to be to have an eye on, uh, Gillespie says, is what criteria are considered in curating content and in curating relevant content. So is it clicks? Is it likes? Is it quantity? Uh, there are some sort of quality information, some sort of quality information going into it. Is it just time? Uh, timeliness, um, uh, sort of um, something being very current. What it, what what kind of co uh, criteria are being considered? So, for instance, in Twitter's trends, right? What does Twitter consider something popular or something important for you for you to show, or how does it curate its uh, uh, its feed? What commercial aims are being followed in the creation of relevance that's something of course i mean in the most blatant um example you could say well there's adversar uh, uh, editorial content um somebody paid for um its product being shown in the top position on google uh, search results but there may be much more subtle and much more um uh, much less obvious commercial aims that are being followed in terms of what actors are being, uh, whose actors' information is being taken seriously and so on. Uh, third point on the challenge of relevance is what are the underlying epistemological premises? Uh, so what kind of, in a sense, a theory of knowledge goes into producing or certifying knowledge through, for instance, search. So Google, for instance, has a strong affinity, first of all, towards Wikipedia, clearly, and to encyclopedic uh, sorts of knowledge, uh, but also to academic knowledge, um, it seems. So um, perhaps that also has, to a degree, its roots in, um, in it emerging or the, the company emerging from a sort of university campus or from the Stanford uh, uh, culture to an extent. Um, and a lot of sort of um, PhD level engineers and so on uh, working in that field. Uh, clearly, anything that is published on a university website will automatically sort of um, rank a bit higher, I think. But also, clearly, the bigger you are, the 
the more um, uh, credibility uh, page rank assigns to um, to content, right? So that's again uh, something that has to do with epistemological premises. What is considered high quality information? What is considered low quality information? I'll continue with um, number four, the promise of uh, objectivity. So let's have a quick think about that. Um, so what, there's an interesting irony in a sense that uh, Gillespie makes out here. He says that on the one hand, algorithms are used and sold as neutral tools in a sense. There is an aura of technological neutrality. So things are simply called results. Well, it's, it's not uh, what we, we, I don't know, crawled or found or something like that, found footage in a sense. It's results. It's the best. It's the top stories. It's the trends, right? There's already in the wording of that in the terminology an aura of neutrality. And uh, Gillespie says, algorithms are stabilizers of trust, practical and symbolic assurances that their evaluations are fair and accurate and free from subjectivity, error, or attempted influence. So that's something that we, I think, as users take very much for granted. So I hope that, or I work on the assumption that I'm being presented a sort of fair picture of what's out there on the internet when I do a Google search. And that may be quite a naive assumption, but it is an assumption that as a user, I think most people make um, that there's not some sort of bias uh, in the presentation of results. But, um, say, argues Gillespie, well, no information service can really ever be completely hands off. Right? There's always some sort of backstage process involved, including often crude censorship. And censorship, I mean, that may well be defensible as well uh, to an extent, right? I mean, uh, we'd be happy, I think, to say, well, uh, I don't know, child pornographic content or something like that be banned from uh, a, a search engine or certain things being not shown to um, uh, I don't know people who are not adults, or indeed certain things that are very dangerous for the public, not being that easily accessible for uh, I don't know information on how to build a nuclear weapon or something like that, or how to build a um, a contagious disease, right? But here already you see well that's potentially quite a slippery slope. And you see there are going to be um, institutions that are going to be very interested in what Google is offering to the public, what information, what perhaps classified information that was leaked and so on. And you know the stories, of course, of WikiLeaks um, and so on and the various controversies surrounding that. But it's an inherently slippery thing um, that information provision can never be uh, completely hands off. Uh, libelous information, things where, um, I don't know, the privacy of people is uh, intruded in and so on. So, albeit, uh, although information services present themselves as impartial, as neutral and so on, really they are most of the time not hands off or never really hands off. There's always curation, there's always backstage. And the irony that Gillespie identifies here is he said, but the fun thing is an algorithm can be defended as a tool for impartial evaluation to those critical of, re, uh, of its results. So they say, well, it's just, we've just compiled, we've just mapped the net basically. And at the same time, it is also promised as a tool for selective promotion to potential advertisers, right? So that's the business um, model of uh, uh, a search engine provider like Google, but also of any social networking site. Um, at the end of the day, the promise to, um, to, uh, uh, yeah, to potential advertisers is we can reach 
a targeted audience and only that targeted audience and in quite subtle ways. And we can influence behavior at the end of the day, right? So impartiality and biasing uh, output towards, um, uh, towards certain uh, consumer ends or, or sales uh, ends is in a sense not 100% not uh, compatible, these two uh, claims. And that I, uh, overall, uh, Gillespie argues, should make us a bit uh, skeptical of that promise of algorithmic objectivity. That issue of algorithmic um, objectivity is, of course, something that is also always sort of brought forward in the context of algorithmic decision making. This is just a sort of slight digression. It's not in Gillespie's paper, but in one by Danaher and colleagues from 2017. And I'll, I'll just touch on it very briefly because I, I thought it would be good to have the slide in here. Um, he says, well, um, in algorithmic decision making, there are really two key properties. The one is opacity due to the secrecy of the laws and or the inherent complexity and automation due to limited human input. That's what we just heard from Gillespie as well. Um, and then there can be various sort of objections uh, be made to that. So for one kind of objection is efficiency-based objections. Bad data, for instance, inaccuracies of the data sets. That's what we called before as too crude, for instance, too simplistic, putting people into boxes that don't quite fit bad data. Or prediction problems. That's the things that we alluded to with the uh, user dossier or the uh, algorithmic identity and so on. But also uh, the practical difficulty simply of predicting human behavior, which is always changing and which is um, sort of complex. So there are various efficiency-based objections um, and they are along the lines of decisions based on algorithms may be inaccurate in some sense. If they are accurate though, there are also various uh, objections that are being made and they are of the what Danaher and colleagues argue of the fairness-based kind. So they argue that somehow decisions based on algorithms um, can treat people unfairly. And how can they treat people unfairly? Well, for instance, there are autonomy-based harms in terms of a lack of consent or a lack of comprehension. That, for instance, is what we just termed the, the, this, this irony of uh, the backstage process of censoring certain things or of pitching certain contents to people uh, while having an aura of neutrality. Two other fairness-based objections, however, are the arbitrariness problem. Uh, people are treated differently for irrelevant reasons. Um, and that could happen simply for, um, you think something distinguishes uh, people, uh, for instance, gay-friendly literature from other kinds of literature, and we treat it differently. And that's quite an arbitrary um, uh, distinction, really. Or the third one, uh, unfair wealth transfers. So again, uh, we just mentioned the commercial aims, for instance, in algorithmic, um, in the design of algorithmic systems or information curation. So there could, this could result in unfair wealth transfers from consumers to firms, but also between consumers or away from protected groups. This could be sort of any sort of protected group. Okay, that was just a, a quick sort of taxonomic uh, view on uh, uh, the critique of algorithmic decision making. Back to Gillespie, and I'm, I'm close to wrapping up this. Um, we said that one, one aspect in the six dimensions of political valence of public interest algorithms, pub, public relevance algorithms, pardon, is the entanglement with practice. And that's an interesting point, actually. Uh, I think that um, that Gillespie uh, is making here and a subtle one as well, because he thinks, well, there isn't really an effect 
of algorithms on people. You can't really think of this as a sort of uh, cause effect thing where the algorithm is just a cause and the behavior is just effect. But really, I mean, to start with, algorithms are built to be embedded into practice in the lived world, says Gillespie. So it's not just a top-down designer uh, point of view that matters, um, but it's there is a multi-dimensional entanglement between usage and design, and between algorithms put into practice and the social tactics of users who take them up or who use them. Okay, the social tactics, uh, uh, Gillespie calls this. So there is no one directional sort of arrow, uh, no one directional influence. Rather, he thinks um, this this whole sort of algorithmic culture, the usage of algorithms, must be thought of as a sort of recursive loop, right? A feedback loop, where on the one hand we have the calculations of the algorithm. But then we also have the calculations, quote unquote, of people, of people using the algorithms and their strategies to produce, I don't know, shareable content, for instance, on social media or to optimize search engine um, uh, placement, right? There's a whole industry that tries to uh, make web content, um, push web content sort of up the page rank. The use of hashtags, I mean, that's a, something that um, many of us, I think, do, or we like things and so on, we click on things. Um, using a hashtag is something that makes content machine, not only machine readable in a sense, but that is actively complicit in, 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 uh, in, that, uh, in that recursive loop and tries to, uh, well, there is a sort of trends feature um, and, Yes, let's use the hashtag to, to get into the trends, right? So the, this is the calculation of the person using the hashtag. So we are actively engaging in practices that are rendering information algorithmically recognizable. We provide, I don't know, podcasters provide transcripts of the podcasts. Uh, we add, I don't know, keywords to things. Uh, we put up a PDF uh, of a, of a paper that we've written and so on. These are all things that, um, that in a sense, show that there isn't just sort of the evil algorithm parsing the net, but there are also um, people actively creating content that is ready and that, that complies with the logic of the algorithm or the algorithms. And, uh, as a side note here, so to speak, um, Gillespie argues, well, some stakeholders, some commercial actors enjoy some backstage access, right? He, he already introduced it. It's not his uh, metaphor, but he uses that. The information, uh, the, the idea of there being a sort of backstage, so the front, page, uh, front stage being sort of the web or the, the, in the user interface, and the backstage being um, the API, the um yeah the design uh the design kind of kind of side and sometimes they uh, some stakeholders have sort of priority or, uh, or prime access to certain information and can um can tailor the content in an even better algorithmically recognizable or relevant way um final point the sixth uh, aspect of um uh, uh, of the political valence of public uh, uh, relevance algorithms, the production of what uh, Gillespie calls calculated publics. And that clearly is in a tradition of what others, Boyd uh, and others have called network public publics. It's, that's a, it's a kind of terminology also that sort of hovered around the media uh, or communication science um, fields, Castells and, so, and people like that also use this terminology. Um, so the, the idea is that publics generally operate increasingly in the form of networked publics. It's something that today, I think nowadays, almost goes without saying that people are kind of networked. I mean, we live in, a, in, a, in an age where 
uh, we commu communicate through, I don't know, WhatsApp groups and email and social media and so on, various kinds of networks all the time. Um, but at some point that it was so new for it to trigger uh, a, a, a term for it, and that was the network public. So we assemble socially through things like social media and so on. Uh, and there's some concern that algorithms of or public relevance algorithms specifically could undermine our efforts to be involved citizens. So for instance, I already mentioned that search results are being actively personalized through search engine providers or the creation of online news or the big topic of uh, micro-targeting where sort of parallel worlds seem to emerge. Uh, and you, you'll have heard of the uh, problem of echo chambers or filter bubbles and so on. Uh, but the, 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 core pro, uh, the core challenge in, in that regard is that content knowledge at the end of the day is being personalized and is being uh, that distinctions are being made between different uh, social groups and the kind of information that is being provided to them. So algorithms also create uh, calculated publics, um, argues Castells. Uh, calculated publics could, could be things like, these are your friends, right? Or these are friends of friends. These are customers like you um, who also bought this book or something like that. Um, these are all sort of forms of, in a sense, authoritative knowledge and even a form of sociological intervention, you could, uh, you could perhaps call it. Um, and this is the final sort of aspect that Gillespie visits and that he says that this needs our scrutiny. So the use of public relevance algorithms creates in a world that is increasingly shaped in the way of network publics, calculated communities sort of that people understand themselves to be a part of uh, and that don't never sort of naturally emerge, but that are being shaped and curated by um, uh, the designers of the algorithm on the one hand, but also as we just saw on the previous slide, the user behavior as well. All right, that's it on Gillespie. <laughs>